Uh, so I've just gone anatomically top to bottom. And this is not a comprehensive collection of fractures, but it is a good sampling of uh, mostly standard common type fractures that you'll see, plus, uh, plus some unusual favorites of mine that I've thrown in along the way. All right, so we're looking at a lateral cervical spine here. And for the benefit of the first years, I'll quickly just run down the lines that you evaluate on any given cervical spine. Oh, and by the way, my daughter is uh, in the chair over here. She's a budding medical professional, so uh, is attending today. Okay, so let's look at the lines. When you look at a lateral C-spine, you want to pick out four specific lines. You want to look at the soft tissues. That's the prevertebral soft tissues. And the rule on those is that the width of the soft tissues above C5 should be less than one third the width of a vertebral body. At C5, you come into the glottis. And so you'll see the soft, soft tissues bulge outward. And so from C5 and below, you want to see the soft tissues be less than the width of an entire vertebral body. The other thing I'll point out and start looking at this is up higher, the soft tissue should conform to the anterior aspects of C2 and C1 right in here. So we can see there is a little too much right in this region. Okay, so the other lines you want to look at are go down the anterior aspects of the vertebral bodies, go down the posterior aspects of the vertebral bodies, Go down the facet joints. You see that line right there? Those are the facet joints. And then lastly, the spinolaminar line. Okay, and the spinolaminar line should be a nice smooth curve like that. C1 will not fit your spinolaminar line. Okay, so don't be disturbed if there's a if this line goes out into space here. The thing you do with the posterior, with the spinal laminar line of C1, is you make sure that it lines up with the back of the uh, foramen magnum. And that can be hard to see sometimes. You have to be taught to look at it, but you will usually see a little curve of cortex right in this region uh, that denotes the posterior aspect of the foramen magnum. And the spinal laminar line of C1 should point at the posterior aspect of the foramen magnum. Okay, so on this one, I probably would have cleared this in spite of the fact uh, that there is a high C-spine fracture, right? This line will be disrupted if you've disrupted the atlanto-occipital articulation, right? So in this particular fracture, it is still intact, right there. Okay, so what this is a fracture of is the dens odontoid process. And you can really appreciate it on the blow up. Right now you can appreciate that the ant, this is the dens odontoid right here. And its anterior aspect should smoothly meet up with the anterior aspect of C2. It should be right in here. And so you can see that that cortex is shifted anteriorly. And the whole dens really is shifted anteriorly relative to C2. But that spinal laminar line pointing to the posterior foramen magnum is still intact, right? Because that relationship has not been disrupted. So this is the reason that we get odontoid films. And I always smile when I look at an odontoid film because I remember my first month of call. After a month of reading these, you know, overnight call, I turned to my attending during sign out and I said, I don't know why they bother with these odontoid films. I can never see anything. Or I think I, I called it the open mouth view because that's the other name for this. I, I said, I can never see anything on these. And he just dropped his face in his palm and said, you know, it's for the odontoid and you can see the odontoid. Right. So oftentimes you've got a lot of tooth overlap. Uh, it's not the greatest view to pick up any other kind of fracture, but what you want to be sure of is that you can clearly see the odontoid and that uh, especially the upper teeth are not covering it, right? So you can see this fracture goes right through there.
And there's been very little side to side displacement. It's clearly just shifted forward. And on the frontal view, you wouldn't be able to determine that. All right, our next one is a hangman fracture. So when you look at this one, you can see that the anterior vertebral line is disrupted right here. This C2 is shifted forward, right? And clearly is not lining up with the other vertebral bodies, right? And here is the fracture itself. It's going right through the uh, pedicles of C2. That's a classic hangman fracture. Uh, before the early 1700s, when they hanged you, they would actually strangle you with a slip knot. Uh, and finally, a guy named Gundry uh, came up with the hangman's knot, which puts pressure in such a way as to snap your C2 right through the pedicles here. So interestingly, as you can see, this has allowed the C2 vertebral body to shift forward and has not actually disrupted the posterior elements or facets. And so it, these are decompressive fractures. Uh, meaning it spreads out the spinal canal rather than uh, impinging on it. Uh, all that said, these often are, uh, are significant in terms of neurologic deficit, oftentimes because the trauma itself will damage the cord or because there's an associated epidural hematoma. All right, so that is a hangman fracture. And again, note that anterior displacement of C2, which should call your attention to these pretty obvious breaks through the pedicles. Okay, this is another hangman fracture. And you can see again, you've got malalignment of the anterior vertebral body here. This C2 is a little too far forward, and there's probably a small chip fracture associated there, which might be an anterior longitudinal ligament insertion, right? This hangman fracture goes right through, right at the junction of the pedicles and the C2 vertebral body. And in fact, I know from the CT that uh, we did subsequent to this, that it actually involves the posterior cortex of the C2 vertebral body as well. But that one is pretty subtle. You would be tipped to it though by the tiny uh, ALL fracture here and the anterior shift of C2. Okay. Now this is one where the spinal laminar line of C1 does not point to the posterior aspect of the foramen magnum. The foramen magnum is right here, right? The posterior aspect of the foramen magnum. And this spinal laminar line is pointing off uh, significantly posteriorly to that, right? In addition, you can see there's distraction between the occipital condyles and the lateral masses of C1. They are not lining up and they're spread a little bit. And there's also distraction here, C1 on C2. This C1 lateral mass is too high. It should be superimposed right over the densodontoid process. So an important point to make here as well is the soft tissues are indistinct and clearly very swollen. The problem is though, when someone is intubated, when they have an endotracheal tube in, that causes both the act and the presence of that tube, causes enough inflammation that evaluation of the soft tissues in an intubated patient is misleading. They'll be thick on almost everyone, right? So you no longer have that to go by. So this is atlanto-occipital dislocation and probably C1, C2 dislocation as well. You don't get to see this very often, mainly because uh, it is typically fatal, right? And you can see the condyle here is not syncing up with the lateral mass. All right, uh, this is just more of a fun one because there's nothing wrong with the cervical spine. This is a hyoid bone fracture. So prior to the development of the hangman's noose, this is what you'd get, right? This is a strangulation injury. There's not much else that causes hyoid fractures. Uh, I did see one in a guy uh, who was riding a mini bike and hit a clothesline, no kidding. But generally speaking, you know, this is something that the forensic pathologists 
uh, focus on uh, is hyoid fractures. It usually means uh, manual or slipknot type noose uh, strangulation. All right, hope this one is obvious to all. This is a bilateral jumped facet. So you can see there's clear step off here. There's no alignment between C5 and C6. And the facet joints, they should look like the shingles on a roof, right? They should overlap nicely so that you see a line down their posterior aspects. And obviously, these are not lining up. And you can see the superior articular process here, inferior articular process here. The, this should be behind this. Right, so that's a bilateral jumped facet. And the bilateral jumped facets are usually pretty easy to spot. The story on this one, I remember it was my early uh, private practice days. This guy was mad at his girlfriend and repeatedly banged his head against a metal pole. Uh, so this was actually self-inflicted. No need to feel sorry for him. So there is, that's a nice view actually of how the facets are jumped in front, right? And these should be back behind these superior articular facets. So it is confusing terminology. The inferior articular facet comes from the vertebral body above and the superior articular facet comes from the vertebral body below. All right. Uh, I was putting this together and remembered my old neuroradiology attending, Joe Seeger, uh, who I thought, God, he, he may be dead. I mean, he's well into his 80s. And I looked him up and he's still practicing, so I'm impressed. But he gave me this case to photograph back in the days when we made photocopies, uh, the pre-digital days. And you can see he had marked out where he wanted me to take the, uh, the picture of this, of this film. Uh, so this is a unilateral jumped facet, and these are much more subtle than the bilaterals. The bilaterals obviously create complete disruption of the normal of every normal vertebral line, whereas with the unilateral facets, the anterior and posterior vertebral lines will be offset, but not dramatically so. Right? You can see this C5 is edging out too far anteriorly and posteriorly, they don't line up either. Uh, so you, you might be able to say something's going on here, uh, but unless you're a radiologist, you're unlikely to pick up the fact that this is a unilateral jumped facet. So here's how you can tell. You've got a perfect lateral. The C6 and C7 vertebral bodies, look at the posterior cortex, one line. There should just be one line there. When you look at the back of the facets, they are perfectly superimposed. Okay, so that's the appearance of a perfect lateral cervical spine x-ray. Now let's go up. You can actually see there's a double line, right, at the posterior cortex of five, four, three, and two. See the double line? It's really nice right there at C3. In addition, you can see the posterior aspects of the facets no longer line up, right? So it's shifted rotationally and so that these are no longer lined up like a perfect lateral should look. And so that is the appearance of a unilateral jumped facet. So when you see this slight offset, go look at those posterior elements because they can definitely tell you uh, what's going on. Uh, this is usually a relatively stable fracture, although uh, important to call nonetheless. It's obviously got to be fixed. Um, the vertebral soft tissues are really nicely depicted here, and I would not call those abnormal. All right, so there's a nice view of that double line that you see at the posterior cortex and the doubling up of the posterior aspects of the facets. This is just another one. This is my own personal one. It's from the uh, my days as an ER physician. And I will always remember this case because this guy was running from the border patrol. I worked down on the Arizona-Mexico border. And so frequently border patrol would bring people in who were hurt in uh, apprehension. And so uh, this guy had fallen down a ravine uh, 
and was complaining of wrist and neck pain. So I got wrist and neck films. They brought him back. I threw the wrist film up on the view box and went, oh, God, he's got this horrible distal radius fracture. So I reduced the radius fracture. I put it in a splint and turned to the Border Patrol and said, yeah, he's ready for you to take him wherever. And the guy said, oh, el quail, el quail. <laughs> and uh, so I pulled, I went, oh, God, I hadn't looked at his C-spine yet. And I pulled out the C-spine x-rays and put them on the view box and went, oh, I was not yet a radiologist, but I did spot this, the offset. It looks just like the other film, right? C5 is anterior to C6. And I almost missed it, not because of a lack of radiologic knowledge, but because I had actually failed to look at all the films I'd ordered. So I kept that one with me for a while. So uh, you can see that double line of the posterior cortex and the offset of the facets here. Looks just like that other one. All right, so that's a unilateral jumped facet. 